I didn't become a hardcore NASCAR fan until I attended my first race, the 1994 Bush Clash at Daytona. My friend said I had to pick a driver to root for. They already had Earnhardt, Wallace, and Irvin. Not knowing much about the drivers, I just looked at all the cars and picked the most colorful one, the number 24. All the other cars were mostly white or black or red, and I thought if the number 24 was willing to put in the extra effort of a colorful paint job, they probably went extra on everything else. On that day, my driver was Jeff Gordon, and he went on to win that race. I had a lot of fun at the track that day, but as a photographer, I couldn't help but think about how cool it would be to have credentials that would get me right down there in the middle of the action on pit road so I could get pictures from that perspective. At that moment, it was just a dream, and I had no idea that someday that dream would be realized. Jeff Gordon went on to win the inaugural Brickyard 400 at Indy later that year in an epic race that solidified my excitement for NASCAR. Indianapolis Motor Speedway was another far-off dream for me. I grew up watching the Indy 500 every year on ABC's Wide World of Sports. The venue is rich in racing history with many of the world's greatest drivers having raced there. A few years after that historic race at Indianapolis, I found this official poster of the inaugural Brickyard 400 and got the crazy idea to find and get the autograph of every driver that started that race. It was going to be an epic challenge trying to run down such a diverse lineup of drivers that range from Greg Sachs to Earnhardt to A.J. Foyt. Many were no longer active or not racing in NASCAR, but somehow, some way, I was able to get my poster signed by all but two of the starting drivers, Rich Bickle and Mike Chase. Hopefully someday I'll get those two and complete my unique Brickyard 400 memorabilia. Fast forward to 2003, and now I find I'm on my way with a new Winston Cup team as their team photographer to cover their first race, which just happened to be the 2003 Brickyard 400. My golden opportunity came when Don Arnold, a commercial developer in southwest Florida, decided he wanted to go racing and he was determined to start at the top level, Winston Cup. This was going to be a family effort, and with them being based in Naples, Florida, I had known them for years. It was Don's son's Dean that called me up wanting a photographer, and he knew I'd be up to the task. I'll be riding with Dean and another longtime friend, Billy Crailing, who was always happy to help in any way he could. Billy's girlfriend Tammy rounded out our crew. It was non-stop action from the time they picked me up on the side of I-4 in Central Florida till the time they dropped me off five days later. It was an experience I'll never forget. Come along in this video and watch as we hit the race shop to prepare for the Brickyard 400. Then travel to Indy and get settled in the garage at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We'll watch the Cup guys practice on track, followed by a nail-biting qualifying session. We'll sample the local nightlife and test our ability to handle alcohol. There was a spirited debate about the merits of downforce and grip, and we'll spend an action-filled day at the track for the Brickyard 400 race. The drive back home continued to be eventful when we stopped at the National Corvette Museum followed by a stop at a motorcycle museum. We'll find out why Dean's mom had to take over driving duties as we made our way to a beautiful log cabin in the woods for a short stay to decompress after a long, stressful race weekend. It's a safe bet that like most of my other videos, 
I'll somehow find a way to fit in a Hooters reference somewhere in the story. We'll start after Dean, Billy, and Tammy have left Naples and picked me up just outside of Orlando. We were driving pretty much straight through to the team's headquarters just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, only stopping for food and bathroom breaks. It was then I got my first look at the controlled chaos I was getting myself into. When it came time for lunch, everyone got to call out what fast food drive through they wanted, and all three of them wanted a different place. So we went through three different drive through lines so everyone could get exactly what they wanted. I let them call out their list first, and then I went with Dean's pick, which was Arby's, because it was the first one we stopped at. Now I know what you're thinking, that's crazy stopping three or four times for lunch. But when you really think about it, their way gets everyone exactly what they wanted, and nobody complained about having to wait their turn in a drive through Time wasn't a factor. Making everyone happy was. It was unorthodox to me at first, but after seeing the results, I think those carloads that hit one spot with half the carload unhappy about the restaurant pick were doing it wrong. I think Dean and his crew's technique was brilliant. It was late in the afternoon when we arrived at the Arnold Motorsports Race Shop located just a few miles from Charlotte Motor Speedway and it was full of activity as the team rushed to get everything ready and loaded for the trip to Indianapolis the next day. I walked into the front entrance to find what I think was their ARCA car on display, and then followed Billy to get my first look at an actual Winston Cup team's race shop. Billy Bigley Jr., a race car driver that was also based in Naples, Florida, was hired by Don to take on the monumental task of driving the number 79 car in their first race, the Brickyard 400. Billy had driven the entire 2001 season in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, so he had some experience and he'd won an ARCA race. This was by far his greatest opportunity, but first he would need to qualify the car for the race. NASCAR legend Bobby Allison was brought on board for his experience and expertise, and he made a great team ambassador. It was very cool to see one of NASCAR's greatest drivers, and one of the few I remember watching on ABC Wide World of Sports. Dean gave us a quick tour of the race shop they had recently acquired, and showed us the stuff they still had to renovate, like the paint room and the dyno. The gym needed a little updating, but there was no time for that as the crew rushed to get ready for the weekend's race. Dean settled in to watch the operation. Billy tried to help whenever he could, and Tammy tried to not be a distraction, but, well, you know. I set out to record the rush of activity while trying to stay out of everyone's way.
Um, this isn't live stream. <laughs> live stream I got the wet. It was very cool seeing all the cars in various stages of construction, and I gained a lot of respect for the guys that work on them. It was kind of crazy that they were just finishing up the car they intended to race, and still had to put all the decals and lettering on the car and the hauler before leaving in the morning. It was going to be an all-nighter for them, for sure. Don and Dean had another meeting to discuss the next step in their rush schedule while I took one last look around the shop before calling it a wrap and heading to the hotel to try and get a little bit of sleep for an even bigger day tomorrow. Do I have any sort of a shirt here? Oh, that does a lot of good. They were really white. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I do have another shirt in that bag. <laughs> Dean, almost. We woke up the next day, grabbed a quick continental breakfast at the hotel buffet, and then headed over to the track where I got my first look at the hallowed grounds of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The Arnold Motorsports team hauler was already parked and the car had been moved to its designated garage stall. Dean's mom Arlene made the trip with her grandkids in tow, as did the rest of the Arnold family, which included Dean's brothers Drew and Stuart. Billy Bigley's dad came to watch his son in the biggest race of his life 
and to help in any way he could. Add to that the friends and sponsors that had also gathered around the hauler, and you could tell NASCAR really is a family sport. Once everyone got acquainted, it was time to get down to business, and I headed over to the garage area to see what all was going on. The cars were getting ready for their first practice session and making sure they could pass inspection. This isn't really the time when you'd see drivers in the garage, but it's possible one or two might show up to check their seat fitting or something like that. I was going to record video of the garage action when the crew asked if I could get a few body shots of the other cars so they could see the shape and contours. I think this was before NASCAR used a very strict template to control a car's body shape. Back then, a team could massage a body to some degree with the hope of gaining an aerodynamic advantage in terms of downforce and drag, which translates to speed. I had a still image capture mode on my video camera, so I told them I could take pictures, but was it okay to do so? They said, everyone does it, just try to look like a race fan, and don't be too obvious. So basically, you want me to be a spy. Exactly, they said. And off I went, feeling a bit conflicted as being kind of important with a purpose, and at the same time, a little bit dirty. Not sure I'll be adding corporate espionage to my resume, but I was there to do my job and earn my lunch, so that's what I did, and boy was it fun.
Where are you? So did you get uh, Tony's autograph? Nah, he was a dick.
took the car immediately back, took it back and had a change made, and they made the right change because they moved four miles per hour faster on one lap. So, you tell me, what's the right thing to do? Sounds like it worked to me. I do. great first day at the track. The 79 team continued to improve all day with a big jump in speed at the end of the final practice, which made them competitive enough to qualify tomorrow for Sunday's race. It was an incredible achievement for this brand new team that was operating without any sponsors, which is why you see the plain white car. With Don's leadership, the team has been working hard and fast for the chance to qualify for a spot on the starting grid for the Brickyard 400. Tomorrow, Billy Bigley Jr. would have two laps to try and put the 79 car in the big show on Sunday. While it was a super fun day at the track, it was a long one as well, so we went back to the hotel to freshen up before dinner and then called it an early night to rest up for a nail-biting day of qualifying that would hopefully get Arnold Motorsports in the race. We got up Saturday morning and once again hit the breakfast buffet in the hotel courtyard, where I continued my deep dive into the scrambled eggs, bacon, and biscuits. After breakfast, we went straight to the track and got ready for a day of qualifying followed by what would be the last IROC race at Indianapolis. We all gathered around the team hauler in anticipation of the upcoming qualifying session. It was cool to see the team show so much confidence with such a monumental task ahead of them today. The cup drivers began to filter in for qualifying and it was about the only opportunity to get an autograph from your favorite driver inside the track. You had to be willing to do a little elbow wrestling to get close enough, but getting that autograph makes it all worthwhile.
stay this out, we get a drop. Tried to get in the scrum a few times, only to get spit out empty handed. Finally, his persistence paid off and he scored his favorite driver. Yeah. Alright. Let me see, let me see. Duh. What'd you get, Drew? Dale Jr.'s autograph. Let's see it. Put your hat. Yeah, man. The only one's going to copy this hat because he's going to be the winner. After that, we all found a seat in the stands to watch qualifying followed by the IROC race. I was super nervous for the team because I knew how much was on the line. I was excited to be sitting in the stands of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway watching some racing action. And I was grateful to hear in person Legendary announcer Tom Carnegie say, And it's a new track record, as he had been doing since his first time behind the mic during the May 1946 Indy 500. This is how it all went down.
going to be in your way? Dean, am I going to be in your way? put out a press release I thought was kind of cool likened him to Ben Curtis maybe someone that could come out of nowhere to make some headlines in this case he's missed the cut and will not be around to play the final round on Sunday so Jim Sauter will live for another day another car anyway Billy Bailey Jr. has uh, been around in NASCAR short track racing and southeastern short track racing for a long time he's a 41 year old out of Naples Florida Long-time standout on the NASCAR Southwest Series, formerly the All-Pro Series, and he's here to take a shot at his dream. A uh, real estate developer in his hometown by the name of Don Arnold got talking to Billy about wanting to go racing and wanting to go racing with Billy, and Billy said, when you're ready, call me, and they had a conversation last fall, and Billy said, well, what are we going to do, truck series, maybe the Bush Series? And Mr. Arnold said, no, we're going Winston Cup racing, and they cut a deal with the Melling Racing Team. Oh! <laughs> for their equipment and uh, support. And here they are at Indy, trying to make the Brickyard 400. Talk about Billy Bigland, the All-Pro Series. He drove for a guy, Don Jacobson, Peerless Woodwork, and that sits right beside the Bristol Motor Speedway and always has been a huge fan of Billy Bigley's. Tell you what, he's doing good. Yeah, he's he's in this show. He do, oh, man, wall. right up against that wall. He's in this show. If he can make it one more corner, it's going down. Yeah, he lost stop, ball, stop. Quit. Quit going that way. Oh, man. He scrubbed off a bunch of time there. Sure that did. Wall. 33rd. That will not be good enough, I don't think. 50 Whoa, hang on. He's going to run. He has to run another lap while he has no choice. But does he have enough oxygen? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Can he breathe, you mean? Yeah. Billy's a 41-year-old. He is living in an apartment in the Charlotte area. His family is still down in Naples. He's got a daughter that's a year away from graduating high school and didn't want to do that whole um, moving thing in the middle of all this to take a shot at this. So Still a good lap right here if he can just hang on. Yeah, if he can stay at four-tenths, a half second, this will make it. Oh, you got to stop. He's going to make it. You gotta stop ball. Oh. Oh. Yeah. This north end of the speedway has not been kind to Billy. I think it's a little faster, isn't it? To the yard of bricks, a little faster into the 49s. It's still in 33rd spot. Ooh, that thing's hot. 49, 939. Is that fast enough? So will Billy get to live the dream and be in the brickyard 400 on Sunday? It's crazy to think that a couple hundredth of a second in speed can make the difference between racing in one of NASCAR's biggest races on the schedule or going home, and that's what the team would be doing today. The odds were against them. They put in a valiant effort and were professional enough to immediately put the day behind them and turn their focus on the next race they would attempt to make, the night race at Bristol.
right there. 250 off the back. After the highs and lows of Saturday's track day, it was time to release all that pressure so Dean, Billy, Tammy, and I went out to have a few drinks and reset so we could have an epic race day at the track tomorrow. It's no secret these guys know how to party, and if you told me the movie The Hangover is loosely based on them, I would believe you. It can be a wild ride. But at the same time, Dean and Billy would never put me in a compromising situation and always had my back if I needed help in any way. Dean made sure I had everything I needed to do my part and went above and beyond that to make sure I had a fun time the entire race weekend. I've had a few key people in my life that could have easily been a positive influence and helped me achieve my goals but they chose to hinder or outright block my progress. Dean and Billy are just the opposite and were unselfishly willing to do whatever they could to make me better. That's the mark of a true friend and why Dean and Billy will always be in my Hall of Fame. After catching up with some friends in their hotel room, we hit a pretty good looking dive bar that had everything but a dance floor. Wasn't long till Tammy got everyone all riled up asking about the motorcycle parked outside the front door. Next thing I know, we're all outside and Tammy's sitting on the bike like she's built to grind. Then she gets the bike's owner to do a burnout in the parking lot, which turned into a bit of one-upmanship as other bikers joined in. It was starting to get out of control, so we climbed into our designated driver's taxi van and disappeared in the smoke on our way back to our hotel. I stopped by Billy and Tammy's room with a bucket of ice for one last drink and somehow became a referee or instigator, depending on how you look at it. Here's the video and you decide. Did you hit him in the nose and pour beer in his lap? I did not. Baby! Explain it now, not later. I didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> who did it? It's just, baby, let me see your nose. Let me see. You can barely breathe. Let me see. Please be by myself. I <laughs> Please be by myself. You don't even have a scratch. It's a blood! You're a fucking minor. Get her, Billy. Tit for tat. Tit for tat. Hey, okay, me, do it. Baby, there's nothing wrong with your nose. You want some pussy? There he is. <laughs> I see a pussy right there. You're bitching and whining about his nose. Thank you, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you push me on the fucking. You push me. Oh, headbutt! Okay, that's... Oh, oh fuck! Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna give her an A for effort. A for effort. You, you hit the wall. Baby, that's gonna hurt tomorrow. <laughs> that's gonna hurt. Maybe that's gonna hurt tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? That means it feels okay now. My <laughs> Baby! Jesus Christ. What happened? Here, yeah, I got like some ice. Dude, I think I just got some ice. Yeah, I got some ice. Yeah, that was. We are not here for your entertainment. <laughs> Baby, tell him to stop. 
I missed last night. I'm getting tonight. That's it. Ow! <laughs> Baby, I need ice for my head. Ow! <laughs> so what happened? She ran her head in the wall? I mean, it's on it video. Was, uh, it was, uh, What's it was, your version? My version. Are you... I can't believe you're actually asking, like, what my version is. I want to know. All night long, my version Because you were there. You were there. Were you there for the whole shot? I, I got it all on video, race. but what it looked like is she tried to run you into the wall, <laughs> but she miscalculated her position and she went head first. I have to say, I would have taken her. She and you know what else? I would have taken her out. She was sober. No, but you know what and else I noticed? You nothing. tried to stop her. You tried to stop her from hitting the wall, but <laughs> right, she Sam, just went just, right into it. You look at this replay, you'll see that. Yeah, I, I can help. play it back. You I did your best to keep her head from hitting the wall, but for some reason she just... You're right, I did, man. What's up Yeah, that? I know. You tried. She's an Indiana girl in Indiana, right? Yeah. She would have been up to her neck and plaster by now if you hadn't stopped her. So. He told me his... Get a close-up of my fucking... <laughs> right there. Oh, I can see it. <laughs> Get that it looks like nothing. So what happened? You were trying to push him into the wall and you hit head first. Skinny. What? I'm not here for your entertainment purposes. I know, you're here for everybody else tomorrow's entertainment. <laughs> I'm wounded and I'm seeing stars. <laughs> I love it. Oh, no. So helpful to people that needy people. Mm -hmm. Oops, there goes my beer again. That's okay. You're still in the... <laughs> Who's sleeping there tonight anyway? So, I mean, you just getting that guy's bed wet or what? I'll, I'll pull the couch out for you. Okay. I think what the problem was is Tammy had just too many drinks and too many chopper burnouts. She can't handle it. Yeah, I've been told worse. But we've got a lot of ice. Ice, ice. You know, Indiana kind of grows on it. What are you mixing? Mess. I mean, I couldn't win if I tried. Don't come over here by me. We woke up the next morning, this time skipping breakfast for multiple cups of coffee before hitting the track for race day. With race team credentials, I followed the team through Gasoline Alley to the track for all the pre-race activities, opening ceremonies, and stayed for the finish to join the winners as they kissed the bricks. It was truly an amazing experience for this NASCAR fan. All those times I watched the Indy races on TV, and not once did I imagine I'd be in the position I was in right now. It was surreal. The gravity of the situation didn't really hit me until I was staying there on the track amongst all the race teams, listening to the national anthem followed by the flyover. I was in complete awe and almost in disbelief that I was standing right there in the middle of it all. I was free to move around trackside for the entire afternoon with my video camera, and this is what I recorded. Where are you going? Were you with this group? Yeah.
on in the end of the year. We're happening. It's race day. Can't We're get it. happening. You gotta get a picture of the Eagles. I was getting ahead of them so I get them walking down pit road.
ceremony that has become just around the fans to become a part of this place, really. I mean, these bricks have been there since 1910, 1911, when this place was first bricked over. Yeah, it's in 2000, and at 159, changes in two hours. How did you like the race? I, I, I Was it good? Race. I like playing in the pits better. <laughs> did your driver win? Uh, Don Arnold's dr driver won. He, I have to pay him 10 bucks. Okay. Oh, he did? It was well worth it. Though. It's worth it. <laughs> All right, y'all have a fun time Bye. now. Hey, see ya. What an amazing race weekend I had at the 2003 Brickyard 400. And I can't thank Dean enough for bringing me along for the experience of a lifetime. Big thanks to Billy and Tammy for putting up with my photographer exploits, and to the Arnold family for being so nice to me as I tried to cover the event. The whole experience was way more than I ever could have hoped for, and we still weren't done with the trip. We headed back to the hotel to finish the day so we could get an early start on our road trip tomorrow. We checked out of the hotel bright and early to start the last leg of our trip, the drive home. Dean's mom joined us for the ride back from Indianapolis, Indiana to Naples, Florida, and with none of us on any kind of time constraint, Dean took us on a few welcome diversions that made the trip back really fun. First side trip stop was the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. The first Chevrolet Corvette rolled off the assembly line in 1953. The Bowling Green assembly plant has been cranking out Corvettes since 1981. The museum was built just a quarter of a mile from the assembly plant and open to the public in 1994. I've always been a Corvette guy, but at 6 feet 6 inches tall, I never thought I could fit in the driver's seat. That was until I heard the C8 Corvette can accommodate someone my size, so I started playing lotto again so I can get me a C8 Corvette Z06. We wandered around the museum and saw some incredible cars that were rich in history. Asking everyone which one was their favorite was kind of like asking where you wanted to go to lunch. Everyone had a different choice. My favorite was the mid-engine Indy Corvette concept car. It was created in 1986. It was powered by a 2.65 liter twin-turbo Indy V8 that was rumored to put out 600 horsepower. The body was made of Kevlar and carbon fiber covering a composite monocoque underneath. It was four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, and had traction control. The interior was futuristic as well with the rear view camera and a 
center-mounted CRT cluster that displayed navigation, although GPS was limited to military use only at that time. Most of the features are commonplace in today's cars. The 1986 Corvette concept car truly was a window into the future, and I loved it. After checking out everything the museum had to offer, we hit the road again for a bit before stopping for lunch at some restaurant on a river in the shadows of a bridge. For most of the trip, I only got to see our drive through waitresses from the shoulders up, so it was nice to see a whole waitress for a change, and ours was super friendly and did her job well. It was nice to sit on the open deck and enjoy the beautiful weather while having lunch. Fully charged, we hit the road again and aimed to drive straight through to our next destination. Arlene had access to a family member's cabin in the mountains of North Carolina near Maggie Valley, and that's where we would be spending the night. After spending so much time in flat Florida, I really enjoyed this part of the drive and getting to see some mountains for a change. I bet this place is beautiful in the fall. Maybe I'll get a chance to return someday and I'll bring my drone for some epic landscape videography. We drove through a few nice little towns and stopped briefly at a riverside stand. Billy got some slushy drink for the ride. I was happy we had run out of Jack Daniels back in India. Billy would have been back in the mix. On the road again with a ways to go but eventually we made it to the cabin well after dark. Dean wanted to gas up the excursion before stopping for the night so we would be ready to go right after breakfast in the morning. Arlene pulled into a gas station and Billy and Tammy performed the pit stop while Arlene gave us a recap of the trip we'd had so far. You were picked up at the gas and station. By Dean and Billy and Skinny and Tammy. Yeah, Yeah. All right. Yeah, look at and, the camera. And we headed <laughs> for Indy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we got to Indy pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yes. Yep, yep. And we did pretty good at qualifying, not yeah, quite well, yeah, good yeah. enough, but we'll do better. But on the way home, we made a few wrong turns. <laughs> yeah, well, why are they wrong? Were they wrong turns? Or oh, were they, well, were they, maybe. Were they just out of the way? It, you mean Billy? See, Billy's not Billy here. was driving there. Billy right, made a bunch of wrong fault. turns. Billy was behind the wheel. <laughs> we Mom, went a little bit to the west when we should have been... Mom, look at the camera when you talk to it. We went a little to the west when we should have been going east. But we're back oh, on track. We're going to turn well, this how, cap around back. Yeah, how right. did you end up behind the wheel? <laughs> uh, Billy go. got tired. Or Billy you, needed some Billy captain. got tired or you just took control? <laughs> I think Mom took control subtly. She was very Somebody had to get us going Mom, east. Mom was very yeah. subtle about the control thing, man. She's always been subtle. Our skinny that. was going to see for the right, Pacific right, Ocean. Have you enjoyed your mystery vacation <laughs> yeah. so far, Mother? Extremely. I think we've had a pretty good time. Yep. Absolutely. After a long day, we pulled up to the cabin, and everyone was pretty much ready to crash for the night, including me. So I went to the room I'd get to sleep in. I woke up the next morning to the sound of running water, so I went outside to explore the surroundings while the others woke up when they were ready. The sounds of nature are the only alarm bells here, and it sure was relaxing. Kill her or what?
awesome as it sits on a beautiful piece of property that had barely been disturbed. The outdoor games. It was quite the contrast from standing on pit road before the start of the Brickyard 400, and I really enjoyed it. Only one thing could get me to leave the serenity yeah, of that like babbling that brook, and that was the smell of bacon and sausage cooking. Arlene had been busy cooking us a breakfast that put that hotel food to shame, and we headed back to the cabin for the best meal of the trip. Once again, Billy was toast, or uh, I mean, he was in charge of toast. I'm worthless in the kitchen, so I joined Dean in front of the TV to check out the show he was watching. It's Lynn Austin in the middle. The first Hooters girl. Yeah. What? They were doing it at the 20th of the month for every month this oh. year. Oh. This is their grand finale in Vegas. I see. Well, they're doing it at the 20th. That'd be close to your birthday. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
After a lap around the museum, we were back on the road with no plans as to what the next stop would be. Secretly, Dean always has a plan, and he found a Hooters and had a stop for lunch so I could visit my favorite restaurant, even though I never asked. Once again, it was Dean's generosity and wanting to be a good host that had him go above and beyond when it came to making sure I had a great time. He even rounded up all the Hooters girls for a picture with me in my new Brickyard 400 t-shirt. The only thing that could have made that picture better would have been Tammy putting on a Hooters tank top and pouring me a beer with the Hooters girls, but I think by that time she was over it and ready to go home. Billy, on the other hand, is always up for anything. Thankfully, they didn't have Hooters shorts in his size. Back on the road again, and with no more stops, everyone made it home safely and our trip was over. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for an experience I'll never be able to duplicate. I did capture most of it in pictures and video, and I hope it brings back a lot of fond memories for them. This video is dedicated to those that made it happen, for those that made my life better, and in memory of those that are no longer with us. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this story from One Photographer's Life.